Bobby. Get him. You are listening to Brave Talk Radio. You're just in time to join today's brave conversations with your hosts, Jackie Little Guest, Daryl Williams, and Tony Emma Hale. Okay, so last week uh, the discussion was about relationships, healthy relationships, unhealthy relationships, how we as a black people have, have gotten to where we are with regard to our relationships. And there, I really liked how you closed out last week with some facts and some statistics about black men and fatherhood. Yeah, well, most people wouldn't be aware of that. And I think um, the point of me bringing that out was just to, to deal with uh, just the way propaganda has been used to deceive us and dupe us into this false narrative uh, that shows us to be these um, irresponsible, irascible, uh, savage-like uh, people, when in fact, if you do the actual research, the numbers reflect the exact opposite. And uh, again, because of all the, uh, the media mind control propaganda that, we, we, that we're always getting, uh, all you hear about is all the negative stuff, and you never hear about any of the uh, positive um, things um, regarding our people. Yeah, it, it's shameful. It, it really is. I know I used to work at the Child Support Enforcement Office, and even working in an establishment uh, of that nature, it was the 4D office run by the state of North Carolina. And, and, of course, if you look through things through the lenses of where you're at, then oftentimes it, it can skew your perception. And then, of mm-hmm. course, media is going to put whatever is going to boost up their ratings, whatever is going to boost up their following, whatever is going to boost up their support. And unfortunately, people love drama. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if y'all remember some years ago, probably back when we were all kids, they used to have a, um, a show called The Good News. And that, that mm-hmm. station would only report good news, good things going on around the world. And mm-hmm. it didn't last because, People don't want to hear the good. They always want to hear the bad. Well, you know, people always want to know something that somebody's doing worse than they are. I mean, why do I want to hear about somebody doing better than I am? Here I am at the ba- the bottom of the barrel, and I'm trying to get to the top, and I don't want to hear about you at the top all the time. Come on, really. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that kind of, that kind of speaks to that whole um adage that says that misery loves company. Um, exactly. Yeah, that's that's pretty, you know, horrible. <laughs> um, but one of the things that we, we, we um, didn't do a lot of was engage in a discussion about this um, uh, uh, book um, and the series, part of the series dealing with Is This Your Man? And um, uh, I, I kind of pondered that in my mind. And uh, that's a pretty good question when, if a woman is considering dating or engaging in a intimate relationship with, with a man. But there's some better questions <laughs> I think need to be asked before we arrive at the question of whether or not a person is your man. For instance, one question that needs to be asked and answered way before the fact is who is this person? <laughs> uh, where did this person grow up? Well, what is this person's familiar background, uh, his, fr- his friends, his acquaintances, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another question would be, well, what are his or her values? And it doesn't just apply to men. It applies to women. Is this your woman? <laughs> what, what are, what, what are her, her values, so, you know, her, her po- community values, her uh, political values, if she has any, her spiritual values? Uh, an even better question on top of that would be what do we have in common? See, we've got to go through a whole process before we get to whether or not this is, this is my man or woman. What do you have in common with that person? Is it, if you're affectionate, is this person affectionate? Um, is, if you like to communicate and, and, and talk about things, is this person communicative? If you're religious and spiritual, is this person spiritual? <laughs> you know, if you're outgoing, is this person extroverted? Or if you, is, is the person introverted? Uh, is the person adventurous, you know? Um, and then um, here's a big point, you know, just the whole background history of the person. And when I say background history, I did a whole lot of talk about history last week and 
just uh, what has led to perhaps the causation of all of these unhealthy relationships. I think part of that has to do with us not understanding who the person is from the standpoint of their background. You know, and when I'm talking about background, I'm talking about their medical history. <laughs> I'm talking about their family history. And today, because of all these uh, uh, noxious, uh, infectious, uh, killer uh, STDs, uh, you, you, even if you're in the church, you've got to ask that person about their sexual history. You do. I, I don't care. <laughs> I know people say you probably shouldn't have that discussion, but I think you need to. Uh, and the last thing that I would bring up before we get to the is this your man is now that if you've had uh, extensive you know, contact and communication with this person and there's some commonalities and you, you like this person, is this person your friend? <laughs> You're right. You're right. Um, you know, I can definitely agree with with all of that because this, I don't know, I, I just, this generation of how people view relationships. And, and I mean, prime example, look at the, these reality shows, The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. And I think Flavor Flav used to have a show out there one time where he was even you know, I guess dating four or five women in order to select one. That this is this is the lifestyle, <laughs> unfortunately, that people are trying to live out in reality. So you ask this question: Is this your man? And um, in this book that Colin Tate wrote, essentially what he does is he describes six type of men that women should avoid dating if they want a healthy and sustainable relationship. So one of the um, things that you said earlier is, who is this man? Do you know him? You know, a lot of times when men are not necessarily interested, and again, we're talking about the black race because that, that is our target, that is our target focus, that is the race that we fall in. And so that is the race of our concern. When we look well, at you know, Tony, that, you know that's, that's perfectly okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> you okay with that, Jackie? <laughs> well, yeah, but I have a question. You yes, ma'am. Okay. Here's your question. Now, I understand all what you're saying, but that takes a whole lot of work, what DW was telling me to do. And... I, you know, my my biological clock is ticking. I ain't got time for all that. Now, well, you, you, have to, you have to make time for it. And, and, and what I was going to segue into is some of what uh, Daryl talked about on last week was we have to kind of get to the root of why we see some of the behaviors in our relationships and in our men as well as our women single women who are trying to, to do these relationships, and even in married couples, because when you don't understand why you do some of the things you do that make you who you are in a relationship, it makes it hard for you to correct those things in order to have sustainable relationships with someone else. And here's what I would say regarding not having the time. Um, again, uh, everything in life from a developmental standpoint involves a process. There is a process that you must go through to get to a certain point or to a certain level, and even on a certain frequency. You have to put in some work. And, again, I didn't want to go back to last week, but I haven't. You know, I wasn't prepared. Again, we don't know. Even, even as, in as much as uh, what I said would be a better question, is this your friend? We don't even know what that – some people don't even know what that entails. Uh, we, it, I'm teaching my daughter this now. Um, there's a difference between someone that you just affiliated with and someone that you classify and categorize as a friend. And since we're talking about relationships, uh, the point of it is healthy relationships. And you do it. You do the research. You do the the, the whole psychotherapy on on marriage and dating and this kind of thing, and um, lasting relationships or, or relationships that seem to stand the test of time. 
what I found is almost every, and I've done, I've interviewed like older couples that I've seen. I've asked them, what is the main thing that has kept you guys together for 20, 30, 40, 50 years? And the overwhelming response you get is that this person is my best friend. So what that means to me is that healthy, intimate relationships must be predicated upon friendship, and that takes work. That, that's not going to happen overnight. And, and there are exceptions to the rules. Sometimes you meet someone and, you know, everything is lined up right. You're on the same frequency. There's this spiritual connection. There's this chemical connection, and it just moves, you know, moves, moves uh, kind of rapidly. But that's not usually the case, <laughs> you know. And, 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 and our point, considering us as African Americans, we're going to have to do some work. Because uh, all, it, let's swap statistics. We have the highest divorce rate in the country. And uh, uh, in, in the black church, the black church has the highest divorce rate in, in the church community. Okay, so that, that right there alone should tell somebody that something is wrong, there are some corrections that need to be had. Uh, it, it, you know, if we're going to really be the head and not the tail, as far as relationships are concerned, that means some work has to be done. We have to get about the business of analyzing who we are, how we have come to be uh, uh, who we are, what, you know, those subconscious things that cause us to keep becoming attracted to the wrong person, married two, three, four, five, six times, all this foolishness that did not even happen during slavery. <laughs> you know, you had some people after slavery ended and people connected, they stayed together, they got married, and they, and they really, as far as the vows are concerned, for better or for worse, to death do us part, they were able to do that. Today, uh, one little thing goes wrong, we're in divorce court. Or you got all of these um, uh, what I call contemporary relationships, open relationships, swingers, all this. And some people are just doing it too. <laughs> all, this, all this stuff that's just crazy and insane. Um, you got to do the work. We, there, there, there has to be some work that has to be done. Let me read this. This will help. Uh, this is taken from Are You Still a Slave? It's a book that was written by Shahara Zala Ali. She wrote this book back in the early 90s, and everybody thought she was crazy. But a lot of this information in this book is dead on. I'm going to read this. It says, Slaves were not allowed to touch or show affection or demonstrate any type of care relationship to other slaves that in the sight of the master or any of his white workers or overseers. Of course, they were able to sneak around down low, sneak around, uh, and spend time with each other. But the master wanted control of selecting all matings and couples among the slaves. He maintained this unnatural control uh, to assure himself of the slaves' inhumanness, which required breeding them like farm animals. So, again, I'm going back to last week. We had five, six hundred years of this. <laughs> okay, so we all, some of us today, subconsciously don't know how to make friends. Don't, we don't know what it looks like to court a woman. I was talking 2016, uh, and I gave some, some very vivid, uh, very pointed, uh, you know, examples of that last week. I don't think I need to do that. But, yeah, we, let, me get, let me stay on point. Your healthy intimate relationships must be predicated upon friendship. Okay, so what is a friend? Uh, we need a definition for that word. I got it right here. It says a person who one knows likes, and trusts. So the word knows connotes spending an extensive amount of time uh, getting to know the person, okay, All right? uh, about the person significantly. And, and then right there, communication will be vital. Uh, every uh, good, healthy relationship is predicated upon communication. Okay, that's trust. It says uh, friendship, uh, oh, let me see, uh, one uh, a person who one knows, likes, and trusts. So what does trust mean? Okay, trust connotes honesty, openness, sharing, reliability. When I call on this person, this person is going to be available to me. Is this person going to listen to me? Is this person going to uh, deem important uh, uh, the things I have to talk about, or my goals, you know, uh, the challenges that I have? You know, dependability, you know, communication, you know, Bible information, you know. Can that person hold Bible information about me? about my background, about my flaws, about my faults, and confidence. These are things you've got to know before you, uh, could, you know, make, make a long-term connection and commitment with somebody. If you, if you don't know that and if you don't know how to do that, oh, it's already doomed before it starts. And can I add one more thing to that? Yes, ma'am. You need to know whether he is a mama's boy 
or she's a mama's girl or daddy's girl or what because mm-hmm. it's very important to your relationship with that person. And you have to also know is mama them going to be all up in our business because that yes, they, is they a detriment <laughs> to your relationship. I'll, you I'll be quiet. need to keep mama and them out of your business. <laughs> Mama can walk yes, up to your house every time she wants to, and every time you have a problem, there's mom and them up. No, honey, that's not going to work. You, that, that relationship is not going to work because you you will get tired sooner or later. So I think that is a very important um, issue that needs to be discussed. You need to look at that before you say, I do, or, you know, you're trying to get serious with this person. You need to look yeah, at that. Yeah, it's just your man. It's just your man. It's just your woman. This is, these are the things that you have to consider when making that determination. Well, 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 how about is this your relationship? Because at the end of the day, you know, Daryl, I hear you talking about friendship. I hear you talking about communication. Uh, Jackie, mm-hmm. I hear you talking about conflict resolution. Can mm-hmm. you and I resolve this issue between the two of us, or do we have to include mama and them? And are you going to allow mama and them and whoever else to get into my business? I think if we, if I had to boil all of that down to, to one simple strategy, that strategy would be that of vulnerability. Are you willing to be vulnerable to me, and am I willing to be totally vulnerable to you because without that level of vulnerability in a relationship, and, of course, that vulnerability is predicated upon trust, it's built upon trust, and it's sustained by trust, that's why you get all of these other breakdowns, the communication, the uh, lack of conflict resolution. And, again, conflict resolution skills, that's something that's learned. That's a learned behavior. You may go into a relationship not having it, but vulnerability will cause you to go out and get some training, some guidance, and some mentoring in that area in such a way that you take responsibility for managing the conflict in your own relationship. But if that relationship doesn't start out with trust and vulnerability, then it's certainly not going to go anywhere along the lines of friendship, healthy communication, or productive conflict resolution moments within the relationship. Because relationships are hard, be it an intimate relationship or uh, just a, a, a friendship that, that has no level of intimacy involved in it. They're hard and they're, they're challenging. They're challenging to start. They're challenging to, to grow. And they're mm-hmm. certainly challenging to maintain. But without that trust and vulnerability from the start, it's not going anywhere. And, yes, it will end up in divorce court. And, yes, mom and them will end up throwing other issues in your, in your relationship before you get married and after you get married. How you start out is how you're definitely going to finish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's a lot of work. It, it, it's a lot of work. But if it's the right person, it's worth it. And my point in bringing up friendship, and I think you just touched on it, Tony, is, uh, before we become intimate or before we get to the point where we're, we're making a lifelong consideration, you know, whether it be uh, engagement and marriage, you know, there's a lot that's, in, that's invested in that. And I'm not just talking money. I'm talking emotions. I'm talking uh, your spirit. I'm talking your heart. You know, a friendship has to be your foundation. And that's what I found in talking to some of the, the people that uh, through it all, through the good times and the bad, they're, they're still together. I've seen couples on Facebook, 100 years old African Americans, uh, yellow eyed and still married, and still showing affection, still you know uh, loving each other, no matter what. You know the the hair is falling out, <laughs> you know the, the the looks are gone, you know the the physical capacity or ability or the person may be physically incapacitated or debilitated somehow, but those two people that came together uh, and built their life together and built it upon the foundation, a solid foundation, with this theory, which is friendship and their spirituality. I'm going to leave that out. Uh, they're still together, and they're going to be together yeah. until the end. And you, you don't find that. But, again, we, we've got a lot of work to do in that. It just, just 
you know, and here's another thing. You've got to make sure that you can stand on your, your own two feet. Because some people get involved in relationships and end up being manipulated into a situation which allows them to be controlled by the other person. And what I'm referencing is that I talked about the one television show that comes on uh, TV1 every Monday called Fatal Attraction. There's another show that comes on right after it called For My Man. And what that show deals with is a lot of these African-American women, like I said last week, they don't want me, they don't want the good guys. They'll, have, they'll get a good guy, they'll get rid of him, and they'll get with a thug, a bank robber, a gangster, a bandit. And before you know it, he's got her involved in all of his illicit mischief. And what every last one of the shows I've seen, the woman has ended up spending the rest of her life in jail, following behind somebody who was no good from the start. And a lot of that emanates from how we were classically trained and conditioned in this country, and I've been doing a whole lot of talking about it. There's one thing I want to read in that regard. You know I always got something to read when I bring on a point. This is taken from a speech given by a racist slave owner who was a U.S. House representative. Uh, uh, he was one of the uh, representatives from U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, his name was Henry, Henry Barry, and this speech was made in 1832, January 20, 1832. To be, I can't read the whole speech, but I got right down to the crux of what I'm talking about. This is um, him speaking at the House of Representatives in 1832. This says, although I have no fears for any general results from the efforts of this class of our population now referring to African slaves, still, sir, the time will come when there will be an imminent general danger. Pass as severe laws as you will to keep these unfortunate creatures in ignorance. <laughs> it is in vain did unless you, you can... To keep, did you say to keep these creatures in ignorance? Okay, we were chattel slaves, so when they use the word creatures, they're talking about animals. That's what we were to them then, and that's what we are to them now. When they shoot us down like dogs in the street, and these cops go in before these judges, and uh, because of what was called casual killing acts that date back to 1632, where you could shoot a, uh, an African or a black man or woman down with impunity, that's what they think mm -hmm. they did. They, think they thought we were animals then, and they think we're animals now. Okay, mm -hmm. so let me read it again. Although I have no fear for any general results from the efforts of this class of our population now, still, sir, the time will come when there will be an imminent general danger. Pass as severe laws as you will to keep these unfortunate creatures in ignorance. It is in vain unless you can extinguish that spark of an intellect which God has given them. Let any man who advocates slavery examine the system of laws that you have adopted. From stern necessity, it may be said, towards these creatures. It's referring to us as creatures again. Okay? And he may shed a tear upon that. And would to God, sir, the memory of it might thus be blotted out forever. Now, this is the crux. This is why I am so adamant about the stuff that I talk about in terms of our behavior, because it was by design. He says, sir, we, read that again, sir, we have as far as possible closed every avenue by which life may enter into their mind. This was a speech that was made in 1832 <laughs> by a House of Representative person by the name of James, I'm sorry, Henry Barry. January, you can look it up online, January 20, 1832. Okay, he says, let me read it again. So y'all, y'all, see, y'all, I know people get upset with me a lot of times when they hear me on the air and I'm making the points that I'm making and I'm speaking about the things that I'm speaking about because I know these things have affected us, affected us then and they affect us now. It says, sir, we have. He's talking to the House of Representatives of this country at that time, in 1832. We have, as far as possible, closed every avenue by which life may enter into their mind. Let me read the rest of it. We have only to go one step further to extinguish the capacity to see the light, and our work would be completed. They would then be reduced to the level of beasts of the field, and we would be safe. So the goal was to extinguish any light whatsoever getting into their mind. And what we're talking about, to be clear, is knowledge. Exactly. exactly. You have a system, 
a system of chattel slavery that was designed to reduce us from human. Um, the Constitution says that we're three-fifths human. It still says that. Okay, so if you understand that, you understand all of these dynamics that we're speaking of regarding healthy relationships uh, or anything else for that matter related to us in this country. <laughs> you know, some things you just gotta you just gotta take it in and you gotta digest it. Just sit down and digest it. Okay, here's a hot another. The point is, they refer to us as creature. And I just read to you that we were not even allowed to show affection to one another. We had to sneak around to be with each other. So all this creeping and stuff that goes on today and all these songs about down low, and down low don't have to be a, a, a brother who's, uh, 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 you know, metrosexual. I just found out what that means. That means bisexual. Or a, a, a brother who's homosexual who's trying to hide his homosexuality from uh, his uh, significant other who may be a woman. Uh, it, down low doesn't always mean that. Down low could mean sneaking around. All of these uh, 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 relationships occurring at the same time, uh, one man dating 10, 12 uh, you know, women, or one woman dating 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 men at one time, sneaking, and sneaking around to do that. Okay, we had to do that on the plantation if we wanted to have some type of emotional tie or connection to someone of the opposite sex. That's not been new. That's been around for 800 years. How long have we been in the atmosphere? Well, again, and some people would use the argument that it's been passed down in our DNA, but that's certainly untrue. It's not a DNA thing. It's a learned behavior thing that has been passed down from one generation to the next, and that's why we have some of the behaviors that we're seeing now in our relationships with regard to the sneaking around, men not being able to stay with one woman or, or single men having several different girlfriends. And sometimes the girlfriends even know about that and they accept it. So when we come back, we're going to go to a break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about the elements of time, trust, and touch as it relates to growing and maintaining a healthy relationship based on what has been handed down to us from our past. So the elements of time, trust, and touch. Stay with us. We'll be right back. You are listening to Brave Talk Radio at TonyEmmaHale.com. Hi, this is Tony Emma Hill, and I've got one question for you. Is this your man? When you're dating a baby boy, there's this unhealthy contract that is signed that I've noticed. The baby boy says indirectly, hey, I will continue to look good. I will continue to give you great sex, and I will continue to make you feel good about yourself as long as you give me a place to stay, food to eat, a car to drive, and a roof over my head. And I always tell women, if the baby boy had his stuff together, he had a, a great career, money, all this stuff, you would be amazed how quickly he would be out of the relationship. Is this your man? Join us for an exclusive series of interview with author Colin Tate beginning Saturday, April 30th, here on the Take It to the Max Radio Network. It's Brave Talk Radio on TonyEmmaHale.com with your host, Daryl Williams, Jackie Little Guest, and Tony Emma Hill. Well, welcome back, America. It's Brave Talk Radio, and we're back, and we're having a very um, informative discussion about, I believe this topic is a spinoff of the book um, entitled, Is This Your Man? And we've been talking about friendship, and we've been talking about trust, and we've been talking about touch in as much as um, during our chattel enslavement, the last one, and I keep, I'm going to keep emphasizing this, for five-plus centuries, we, there are certain things we just weren't allowed to do. And as a result of that, with the generations that have since been had, that affection, showing up affection has not really been the norm in most cases because people during period of chattel enslavement had to sneak around. And I, I was making a point before we went to break about the cheating and the creeping and the download and all the other stuff that a lot of our people engage in today, unconsciously or unconscious of the fact or not cognizant of the fact that this is 
a carrier um, our challenge slavery. And then there's this thing, too, I want to deal with before we deal with that anymore called the fear of commitment. Sometimes um, you, you encounter people and you, people can engage and indulge these relationships that last 5, 6, 10, uh, 11, 12 years, and no, there's no real commitment. Uh, and every time the subject of marriage or any discussion is had regarding the validation uh, of that relationship, there's this unwillingness by either party to do so. I want to read something here real quick. Uh, and this deals specifically with um, the black man, but it applies to black women now too. It says black fathers, like black mothers, love their children and share the same desire to have a home and family. They do not repel this commitment based on an intimate dislike for the family unit. Black man's ego, self-esteem is so fragile that he rejects any situation which targets his inabilities or shortcomings. He is overly sensitive to failure, and disenfranchisement both educationally and economically further weakens his drive to become a part of a family unit. Even if he knows that his woman knows that he is treated unfairly in the workforce, his own frustration is based on the seemingly hopeless situation of his not being able to provide for his family. This knowledge, whether real or imagined, speeds up his abandonment of any attempt to sustain a family. Men continue to view the economic dependency as a guarantee of fidelity in women uh, to validate their authority in a marriage. They also see economic dependency uh, on a subconscious level as the way to keep the black woman out of the employ of white males. They view the financial support of their family as a protective measure that women don't usually understand. All of this makes him feel devalued, and his social role pattern has been dismantled mainly due to economics. Now he just won't deal it. He knows for a fact that with the advances of black women seem to make our merely attempts by white males to keep him subordinate. If money is the measure, then he knows he can't compete. So he has to convince himself that he doesn't want to settle down and have a family anyway. And he has to convince himself that supporting babies is really not his problem. This all links back to slavery, by the way. He disconnects mentally, emotionally, and spiritually from childbirth and child ruin because this is an area in which he has no real control. On the plantation, his only value was that of a common laborer and his agility as a stunt. So this is what, 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 what's being said here subconsciously with some men. This is what drives this, this fear of commitment, not wanting to be responsible, not wanting to compete with his woman, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there are a lot of women that end up with these kinds of men, and they end up frustrated and spending years in relationships that are never going to end in marriage. <laughs> And they stay there uh, hoping that at some point the brother will, you know, or it, it could be a man in a situation with a woman. Because there are a lot of women now that don't want to get married. You know, you've you got this thing going around now called friends with benefits. You know, we can be friends for, for uh, 10 years. You, and I even had someone tell me who was a religious leader that uh, when I got divorced told me, uh, why would, he asked me what my plans were. And I said, well, I would like to meet someone. And, 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 you know, to take my time and really develop a good friendship with him and then, you know, hopefully get married. This, this religious leader said, well, why would you want to do that? He said, that's the problem. There's too many people wanting to validate their relationship with, with, uh, with, uh, with a piece of paper. He told me, this is a religious leader in this city, said, what you need to do is just meet you somebody and you guys, I'm, I'm quoting him verbatim now, you guys determine when you, got to, you, you, know, when you need to have your needs met Y'all get together and take care of your needs, and you go your way, she go her way, uh, no strings attached. This was from a religious leader, and this is the mindset that a lot of people have now. Yeah, and, and that's from an uh, ignorant <laughs> religious leader, whoever that was. I can't call his name. I wish I could. I wish I could. <laughs> yeah, that's some pure ignorance right here. Nothing more than ignorance. But the fact that it came from someone who is part of the clergy, speaks to the enormity of the situation regarding the mindset of our people, some of our people who engage in these types of relationships and think that they are okay. Well, I, I think that the, the problem is a little deeper than that as well because when you have that type of advice, that type of counsel, if you will, coming from a religious leader who people are dependent on, 
for their spiritual guidance, particularly their guidance in relationships. And I, I actually had a conversation with uh, someone today just talking about the false expectation that people put on these pastors and leaders to take responsibility for their relationships when, in fact, you need to take that responsibility yourself. And, again, it starts with knowing who you are and why you are the way you are. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you that conversation... You yeah, without knowing the why, you don't know what it is that you need to correct. Well, let me just let me just let me just clarify uh, what that conversation uh, that was had between me and that person told me was not so much about relationships, but about that person. <laughs> and, oh, and just how yeah, just how superficial some of our so-called religious leaders are with regard to how they choose to live their lives when they're not. You know, before well, and, 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 and again, you again have a person who is in a position, presumably, to affect how a person manages their life based on the counsel that they give them. And, right. and that's, a, that's it's, it's very dangerous. And then this person who, in effect, takes that counsel and runs with it, and think that they're living a happier life or, or their success of broken relationships and noncommittal relationships is the way to go, they're going to share that information and counsel to someone who's looking to them for advice on how to maneuver in a relationship. And now you have this domino and snowball effect. Just as I said, these same types of behavioral traits were passed down from the days of slavery that are still prevalent in our relationships today. And well, that type of counsel emanates from, and we've been, I've been talking a whole lot about this, and we've talked a whole lot about liberal theology. That's where that type of counsel emanates from. And a lot of people are misled by that whole liberal theological approach. And, and, and again, that speaks to, again, I, the, the television show I was talking about, and when I was saying you have to be able to stand on your own two feet and make your own determination about things, uh, the show called For My Man, where women are misled into these criminal lifestyles because they become emotionally attached to degenerate personalities and feeling that, you know, they have no choice, uh, you know, and, and some people, and, and that's one of the points that's made on the show is a lot of times these women end up in these deleterious relationships because they don't feel they have any choices or better choices. And in my mind, a better choice would be just to stay single until you meet somebody that's, you know, uh, uh, that qualifies, you know. Yeah, but that's, my, that's just, my opinion. We all just want to be loved. Everybody wants to be loved. And the first, you know, it's like, your, your self-esteem is sitting way down in the bottom of your boot. And the first person that comes along and pulls it up, you're going to be like, okay, this is it. This is the one. And I've never had anybody come and pull me up out of the bottom of that boot before. So, mm-hmm. hey, this must be, he must really love me. And look at all the good well, things he does for me, regardless of, you know, all the other, you know, i, I got to outweigh the good with the bad. So, you know... Yeah, he pops me upside the head, he beats me, he talks about me, he cheats on me, but I still want to be loved. And I think that has a lot to do with, you know, we are looking for love, and we have no clue what love means. Like you had said before, D.W., when you were talking about mm-hmm. love, we don't know what love means because our <laughs> forefathers, a lot of them didn't know. So yeah. Well, something here, here. that I don't even know. What it what it really means? Well, we dealt with self hatred and self contempt and just the, that whole psychosis and pathology before uh, weeks ago, and I and I said on the show last week, uh, before you go connecting with anybody and looking for love from without, you have to develop it from within. You have to love. You have to learn how to love yourself. I've been single now for five years. And I'm, I love me some me. I'm happy. I'm happy by myself. I'm happy when I'm in the coffee shop doing my research and my reading. I'm happy on the weekends when, when I have my daughter and I spend time with her. I'm happy. My music makes me happy. I like to go for walks. I like to exercise. I do things that make me happy, that make me proud of myself. And that's my mentality. That's my uh, approach. So you, have, you have to first, see, you said looking for love. If you love yourself, yeah, you'll be looking for companionship, okay, not love. Uh, love, you need to love yourself first. 
Uh, right. uh, we started off with, uh, when we were talking about self-contempt, uh, the scripture we used was love your neighbors as you love yourself. See, you've got to start with yourself first. If you don't love yourself, you're looking for someone to uh, complete you or not, not, not to complete you, but someone to make you. You need to make you. You need to make you. You need to be whole. I've heard uh, Stevens, Dr. Stevens say this. You need to be whole uh, first before the fact, before you go connecting with someone. You can't have two half people trying to come together to create one whole. You need one whole person uh, in the form of a man and another whole person in the form of a woman. And if they're compatible, if they have something in common, if they have a, a common spiritual ground, if they have some commonalities, uh, and as much as their family history is concerned, if there's some commonalities, even as much as their sexual history is concerned. And I'm not advocating that a person engage in fornication, but if that person has had a prolific sexual history uh, and you plan on marrying them, okay, we need to go to the doctor and make sure you don't have nothing. <laughs> yeah. Before we get married and before we do it, that, that's just a conversation we got to have now. I'm sorry. And, again, I've been, I've been, I've been by myself now for five years. I've been in a serious relationship. That, that I can recall in five years. And here's the thing with me. I don't waste time with people, okay? Uh, when I'm, when I'm, I'm going to use me as an example. We can close the show out this way. Uh, when, I, when I'm in pursuit of someone and when I meet someone, um, yes, yeah, she might look good, she might sound good and all that, but when I go out with her, I'm going to ask her out for coffee. I'm going to ask her, can, I, can we go to lunch? And we're going to talk. And I have five questions that I ask. And depending upon how that person answers those five questions and their body language will tell me whether I need to waste my time making a phone call, whether I need to waste my time uh, uh, asking that person on a second date. By spending time, I'm not going to spend time. I'm 51 years old. I don't have time to spend uh, a year, two years uh, on an inquisition with somebody and that relationship not lead to nothing. Okay, so it's a process for me, but it starts with me being uh, satisfied with me, fulfilled, uh, uh, you know, uh, happy with myself internally, psychologically, mentally, uh, you know, and then I'm in a position now, if I'm happy with me and I got my stuff together, now I have something to offer somebody. I don't have anything to offer anybody if I'm looking for love for them and I don't love me. That's and right. this is how a lot of people end up in these from my man type relationships or they yeah. end up in these abusive relationships where they're being beat on, they're being verbally abused, they're being exploited financially and taken advantage of, and they'll stay there because they don't feel like they have any options because they don't love themselves. A person who loves themselves is not going to allow somebody to abuse them, not going to allow somebody to beat them, not going to stay with somebody they have nothing in common with just to have somebody. That's not somebody who loves themselves. You got to love yourself first. And I want to go back to a point, looking for love versus companionship. Because back in the book of Genesis, when, when God made woman, what he said was it's not good for man to live alone. It's not good for man to be alone. So when he created woman out of the whole of man, he created woman for companionship, not for love. Hello, somebody. Mm-hmm. That's how we get it wrong. And, and again, by, by no fault of our own, it's because of that desire to experience what we saw or what we thought someone else was getting that we weren't. And again, we're talking centuries ago. So that's how the whole skewed perception of pursuing love versus companionship came into play. So you just made a valid point. You just made a valid point. You just made a valid point, Tony, because one of the people that I interviewed when I was on my own little uh, psychological journey trying to determine what it takes to be in a relationship that could last 30, 40 years, uh, there's this couple that I know, they've been together 42 years. And I spoke with uh, the, the, the man, the husband, rather, and one of the things he told me was, that when he married his wife, he didn't marry her because he loved her. He married her because they were best friends, right? <laughs> this is yeah. this is people. This is that word which fascinated me. I was like, "What you did?" Because we're led to believe that you're supposed to get married because you love the person. He said, "No, I didn't love her when I married. I loved her because we." You are listening to Brave Talk Radio at TonyEmmahale.com.